time with the rosemary, and if you leave it in too long, it gets woody. Uh, we do it in secondary. A lot of people don't realize what a big factor, again, timing has to do with your ingredients. So really um, figuring out whether you want to put it in in primary or secondary, you know, for different parts of the flavor and making sure that it, you know, the if it's something that can add undesirable tannins, that it, you know, you get it out of there before it, it does that. Um, in the case of certain fruits and that, that stuff, um, it, you know, um, I think that the the herbs and um, botanicals and that kind of thing are really just a... I mean, we did this uh, ruby red rose with grapefruit zest and um, rose buds, and it was kind of interesting because the oh, rose okay. buds were... It, you know, we put them in, and they they came out so well and so forward at a different timeline, a completely different timeline uh, to the to the grapefruit. And then, um, strangely enough, leaving them in for a little longer, a little past time, it, it, it was like the, um, the aroma and the, you know, forward part of your palate, all that rose kind of faded back in uh, a little bit. It, it disappeared, but if we pulled everything out right away when we sort of hit, you know, peak infusion, we came out with something that was just awesome. And um, we learned a little bit, of, you know, um, this go around and we'll be ready for next year. Um but the thing is to, you know, with any problem, like how do you add, you know, basil, uh, break it down uh, to what you want out of that and think about the flavor and what might or might not be coming out of that ingredient. Yeah, that's a big thing. And it's hard to, it's hard to know sometimes that, you know, how things are going to work. I mean, the one, my one attempt at a rosemary mead was an utter disaster. It was a dump it down the sink, didn't work at all. And it was because I was really not used to working with it, and so I didn't do it well. You know, this was years and years ago. But um, now I'm kind of looking at, I'm actually looking at going back and revisiting the uh, multi-spice mead that I made as my first mead that turned out terrible and took years for it to stop being terrible and start being good. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, knowing now what I didn't know then, I'd love to go back and do it again and see how it would, just to try it and see how it would turn out, to do a one-gallon batch and see how it would turn out and, and whether or not it'd be different or better. Yeah, I would think. Rosemary yeah, and the thing is, once you know more about certain spices, and you know, I, I think there's a there's a real um, having looked, you know, gone through a bunch of homebrew competitions locally. Um, there's a real tendency of people uh, to um, not take a lot of notes, um, not compare you know, with last time they made something. And to be honest, like, I'm not the best. Um, if I were making batch to batch to batch, I probably wouldn't have kept the same notes I did doing sort of controlled experiments where I was doing a lot of things in parallel and had to keep the notes um, and was able to try different levels of different things Um you know, there's a, there's a big tendency to just kind of dump some stuff in, and if you don't like it, um, say, oh, well, that didn't work. But if you try different levels of it, try, you know, um, you know, uh, try different time uh, intervals for put, you know, adding it. One of the nice things about mead is if you're adding something in secondary, you could, you know, separate your mead into, you know, 24 bottles and do 24 different things to try out a flavor. 
or a number of flavors at the same time, and then on your next full batch, scale that up to you know a full carboy and do it there. Yeah, speaking of, of of flavors, do you um do you favor a particular yeast over over another, uh, or do you um make you know do you experiment with different types? We do experiment with different types, and we're uh, looking to use um, to start growing our our yeast um, a whole, um, usage a, a little bit. Um, so we've stuck primarily to white wine yeast, and we're going to start working a little bit more with beer yeast. I think now that we have really good um, methods for taking care of it. Um, you know, we've got our yeast, our nutrient additions down, our pump over methods down. We've got um, jacketed glycol, you know, glycol jacketed tanks that we can set our temperature and, and not have to worry about it. Um, so we've really got process control. And I think a lot of the beer yeast, um, especially at the homebrew sort of scale for um uh, were harder to work with um, and more had a tendency to get more off flavors easily because they weren't well suited to dealing with the um, with um, the lack of nutrients and the different you know sort of temperature or lack of control that kind of thing. But now we have such good process control and we have a little bit of shelf space and tank space. Right. We can get uh, a little bit more creative with uh, different beer yeasts, and we found a, a number um, of them that we uh, we really want to turn into larger batch things. Hmm. Have you tried uh, Have you tried blending yeasts? We knew that was coming. Uh, we have <laughs> oh, yeah. tried that a little bit. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Really? Um, but it's you know it's tricky, and to be honest, our old space. Um, was small enough um, that it made it very difficult to entertain doing any of this. Mm -hmm. um, and for the last three um, years or three and a half years, it's been nothing but um, full throttle forward on the business side. So the experimentation We've done a bit, but not enough, um, and we need to do that in sort of mid-sized batches um, with a little bit of control. So, yeah, we've tried um, mixing yeast a little bit, but we, um, I'd say to have a really strong handle on it, um, I'm going to look forward to being a little bit more done with construction and a little bit more into... Um, learning the craft again. Mm, cool. Thanks. So what are you, you were saying learning the craft again, what do you want to go back and fine tune, expand? Well, I, I mean, I think that there's, you know, you look at the improvement in both the pro needs that are out there and on the homebrew side, um, over the last 10 years, and it's mind-blowing, um, yeah. the variations and the, and the quality uh, change overall. And I think that in the next 10 years of mead-making, you're going to see um, more and more creative stuff. I mean, just look at the, the number of yeast strains that are available to us as brewers and home brewers now uh, that weren't 10 years ago. It's, uh, that alone is a, is a real um, stalker. So, yeah, when I say going back to learn that, I mean, I've been installing a lot of wiring and plumbing and trying to build out our new space and getting our uh, packaging machinery uh you know, working, you know, smoothly and that kind of stuff. But really, um, you know, getting back to doing more um, brewing and experimentation and coming up with um, the next round of 
you know, flavors and products that are really mind blowing, that would be, um, you know, that's a, that's a goal. I mean, we're constantly doing a little bit of that, but even more, um, I mean, that's, that's in theory what we're there to do, um, all the time, but that's like most small businesses. It's about, you know, 5% of the work or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, um, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You were going to say something. This, this can wait. We do, um, at our, um, tap room, keep a, um, some rotating flavor experiments going on a, um, you know, special draft line we call our Project X tap. And that allows us and, uh, you know, whoever uh, is around at the time really to, that <laughs> might be interested in, in working with something or trying out something to, you know, make, put something together and uh, put it in front of people and see, uh, you know, see what works uh, and what doesn't. So we've, had a chance to gauge reactions to a lot of different uh, yeast strains and hop profiles and all sorts of different things. The raspberry coconut, um, you know, sort of started. It's uh, is something my roommate um, put together. Um, you know, or a, a lot of products that we that we do start right there. You know, we'll fool around with it a little bit. Take a guess, put it on the Project X, see how people react. If we feel like we need to bring up or bring down certain flavor components, we'll do that. Well, the raspberry coconut's a winner in my book. Yeah, it's just a description. I will be sure. It's almost. I will be sure to, to pass that along to Elliot. Yeah, please tell him. I really like it. It's. I keep thinking it's like it's beach mead. You know, yeah. it's totally yeah. beach mead, you know. <laughs> I will I will definitely let him know. Yeah. In fact, I could, I could um, see this being like surfer mead. <laughs> it's totally <laughs> rad, dude. <laughs> well, when we go, go global and we're putting commercials out there, I'll be sure to keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> you take it to Australia, you know, like you have the really big waves. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's been a really uh, interesting experience the whole, whole way along, but I, I can't wait to um, get things a little further down the road and I, uh, we're in the process of trying to work out um, a tap room at our new space um, and to get more things in front of people on a regular basis that are short runs, special releases, that kind of thing, where we get to take some of this wilder experimentation up to a, a production level, you know? Yeah. I like the I like the specialty stuff because it's fun to see it come out and, and then it lets you see you know how it's going to do and whether or not you want to add that to your regular rotation. I definitely feel that the, um, I mean, our raspberry coconut, um, is, is already in, in high demand. We thought, man, well, we'll just do this short, tiny little run of it. But, um, sure enough, uh, a few places quickly requested kegs and, um, <laughs> I've already made big commitments. That ruby red rose with the grapefruit zest and uh, rose uh, infusion just was so floral and bright. Um, I I, I want to bring that on as a full time thing, but I guess you can't make everything a full time flavor. Yeah. But you could so, have it as a regular know. rotation, though. I mean, have it come in every spring or something. I mean, it's not like Definitely. even if you don't do it full time, you can make it a specialty thing that seasonal. People have, yeah, that people have to wait for, and then they want it all the more. And then you could charge more for it. Uh huh. Yeah. 
But yeah, I want some of that. And when you do do that again, please let me know because I will drive up and get 